uh, been encouraging. So uh, let, let me get let me get into what is really going to be a basic introduction into a what I'm, I foresee as a long series, and I just want you to trust you hear from from my heart as your pastor. But but here we are, right? One week one week removed from celebrating this annual greatest day in, in, in all of church. And, and I really, my prayer is, is that I, I know we do it collectively as a church as a whole, but I, I hope that that same celebration in your own spirits is every day because it's, as Pastor Zach said, it's, it's just as real every day as it is Easter morning. Uh, it is, it is uh, significant. And so we, we made this journey to the cross preceding Easter where Jesus, he had his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey and he experienced what we know as Holy Week or Passion Week and he had his last supper or communion with his disciples and he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot and soon to be arrested by the Jewish leaders and then eventually abandoned by all of his closest d disciples and he went through his trials and then he was ridiculed, mocked beaten, whipped, and tortured until finally brutally nailed and hung on a cross by a Roman crucifixion. But then three days later, three days later, he rose from that grave. They found his empty tomb and for 40 days he showed himself to his disciples, to his followers, to a group of over 500 at one time before he finally did ascend in the clouds where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And this is important. We're going to hear this this morning. In heavenly places. In heavenly places. Interceding for you and I. Waiting his return to us again one day. So here we are. So now what? Now what? While we are his people, we're, we're still here, contained in these fleshly bodies, living in this fallen world, a world that continues to be deceived by the devil, who is described by Jesus himself as the ruler of this world, described as Paul as the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. John writes in his first letter that, that, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So what changed? Didn't Jesus say it is finished while he was hanging on that cross? But even when he stepped out of his tomb on that Sunday morning, he didn't step into heavenly places and ultimate glory. He stepped back into this fallen world where you and I live now. Now before I get thrown out of the church, let, let me explain some things here. Hear, hear me out. <laughs> I'm going to do a little preaching to begin with, and then I'm going to go into a teaching, all right? I'm not going to ask if that's okay, because I don't need your approval. I, 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 I truly live my life for the audience of one, and if I please him, all the rest will take care of itself. So what changed? Well, I want to talk at least about one thing that changed, and it's significant, because it's actually what he accomplished on that weekend. And this isn't our main text today, but I want to go to Colossians because it really sums it up. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And it says this, and you, say me, me, you, all right, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's literally talking about a certificate of death that we have on us before coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's referring to the law that no man could meet its perfect standards except the man Jesus Christ. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the face of all the universe, of heaven and earth, he made a spectacle of them, defeating them, then and forever. So God is, God is sovereign and he's determined for a time that mankind will remain in this fallen world. 
And he's established boundaries and he's made sure that Satan's domain is limited. And might I proclaim this morning, very limited to certain ones. The Bible describes the devil only having power over those whose eyes have been blinded to the truth. He only has power over those who have been captured by his snares. He only has dominion over those that have been deceived by him, known as the father of lies. He has no power or dominion over those who've been cleansed by this blood. He's, he's got no power or dominion over those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How many, how many know the one who I'm talking about here today? How many know this one? This, this, this one that, that, that said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know the one that Philippians 2, 9 and 10 talks about, who God also has highly exalted and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. You know the, you know the one that Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 talk about, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The, the, the one who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The one in whom all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been, cre have been created through him and for him. That's the one. That if you know him, I'm telling you this morning, Satan has no dominion, no rule, and no power and no authority over anything involving your life. If you don't hear anything else I say today, you and some do need to leave. God bless you if you do. I'll tell you, you can walk out of here and live victoriously just with that. You know what the summary of that is? The devil has no power or dominion over those who know this one Jesus. That's why James said in chapter 4, verse 7, submit to God. People forget the first part of that verse. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You're a fool. You're going to just try to resist the devil on your own. Submit to God, then resist the devil. And he doesn't want to flee from you, but he has to flee from you when you are in relationship with this one Jesus that we're talking about this morning. So now what? Let's ask this again. So now what? While we as people are still contained in these fleshly bodies, living in this fallen world, well, we can confidently live our lives with him and therefore for him, and we do it together as a church body. As a church body. We confidently can do this, and he has, he's not only given us his abiding, if this isn't enough, he's not only given us his abiding Holy Spirit to, to live within us and to, and to empower us, but he's given us this word to sustain our spiritual health, strength, and well-being. Well so, how many, how many of you experienced this where you, you, uh, you were famished and you just woof, some, you, you woof something down, you ate, and about half hour later, you're still just super hungry? I mean, you, 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 you ate what you did, you, 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 and a half hour later, you're hungry. May or may not have something to do with what you're eating, uh, but similarly, this can happen to us spiritually. This can easily happen to us spiritually. Um, and, it's, and it's important that we see ourselves, you hear me say it a lot, it's important that we see ourselves as spiritual beings with souls and contained in these decaying, might I say, decaying bodies. I tell my wife, I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. And so I'm not going to claim something that's not true. These bodies are decaying. But my spirit and soul are going to live forever and ever and ever because I'm going to receive a glorified body one day when I meet my Lord and Savior. Whether it's while I'm still remaining on this earth or whether he takes me home, I will live forever. Did you know that spirit and breath, 
this is so interesting to me, spirit and breath are, are uh, translations for a singular word in both Hebrew, Old Testament, and Greek, New Testament. So in Genesis 2-7, when it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and what did he do next? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. There was no real life until God breathed into him, and he breathed his spirit into him, breath and spirit. In John chapter 20, verse 22, and when he had said this, this is John's uh, rendition of Christ appearing before his disciples right after his resurrection. And it said, and when he, when, he, when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Real life. Real life. And so if we're going to live this overcoming and victorious life that God has, Christ has already gained for us and promised to us, we must give more attention to our spirit and soul and a whole lot more to this flesh. Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. You know that both in Matthew 4 and 4 and Luke 4 and 4, he says, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And what did Jesus say to him? It is written. There is a word of God. And it says they, that the, both of those passages say the same thing. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word of God. Ever since becoming your pastor, it's, I've heard him saying those same words that Jesus spoke to Peter when he restored him after his resurrection. I hear him over and over again. And in John's, John 21, we won't go there, but he, he asked Peter if he loves him three different times. And Peter answers him, yes, three times. And and each, each subsequent time, Jesus said something to him. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Tend to shepherd my sheep. Peter, do you love me? For the third time, yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. This is an emphasis of the Lord Jesus He's restoring Peter. Now we know he's the chief shepherd. We know that Psalm 95 and 7 said that we are the people of his pasture. We're the sheep of his hand. And he said in John 6 and 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And so in this post-Easter celebration time, and for the next several weeks, we're going to be feasting. There'll be no serving up, no Twinkies and cotton candy at Stonebridge Church. I'm not doing it. We will not be a church an inch deep and a mile wide. We will not. We're going to know Jesus more and more for who he is, so he can do a work in your life, your family's life, and this world. This world needs a Savior. They need the Lord as he shines through us. And, and so we're going to be feasting on Paul's letter of Ephesians. Ephesians provides us with, with, with an already thing that we work on as, as pastors and ministers and preachers and teachers coming up with, with themes and a structure. And, and the Holy Spirit's already done it for us here in this book of Ephesians. Who better, than, who better to put together a, 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 a sermon series, Pastor Gary, than the Holy Spirit? And so we, we are going to be feasting in Ephesians here. And to, to start this off, let me remind you, as a church, we've had a rally cry this year of, of, of building up. Last year was a year of increase and really felt the Lord stirring. That we, this is going to be a year of building up. And it needs to start with building up the individuals as our faith. It needs to build up our faith as a collective church body. And it can build up the kingdom. And you see the theme, build up, build up. And so as I'm praying about this, I come to Acts so I'm going to start in Acts to jump into Ephesians, all right? Is that all right? Again, why do I ask if it's all right? It doesn't matter if it's all right. But let's go to Acts chapter 20, verse, verse 28. And, and, and Paul is in uh, Miletus, 40 to 60, all kinds of uh, estimations how far it is from Ephesus, 40 to 60 miles south of Ephesus. And he is called for the elders of 
Ephesus, the, churches, uh, the church at Ephesus or elders from that region. And he says this, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or elders to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, listen, this is, this is the heart of a true shepherd. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. These, preser these perverse things are, they can be subtle. It's not like somebody's going to rise up and say, hey, come worship the devil with me. No, they just want to get your eyes off of Jesus and distract you one step today so you can be miles off course next year. To turn aside from the right path. This perverse means corrupt or wicked. From among you, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for, for three years, as he spent those, that, that, that time in Ephesus. I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And here it is, verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an, inherit an inheritance among all those who are sanctified or set apart as his people. So let's jump into Ephesians. And I'm... I'm going to talk fast. You think I talk fast regularly? I'm going to really talk fast. So that's why, in my, let's take advantage of modern technology. You can go to our website. You can go to our YouTube channel. And you can, uh, not to listen to me again, but to hear what the word of the Lord is saying this morning. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Just going to read six verses, and then I want to build a foundation of some context again as we look to start this amazing, uh, uh, looking into this amazing letter from Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Where is he right now? He's in heavenly places. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Beloved, capital B in, in, my, in my translation, it's referring to, it's a messianic title for Jesus. It's referring to uh, that which is in Christ. Let's just ask the Lord to help us. Father, we thank you for your word. It is the, that is our foundation. It is our life source. It is our spiritual sustenance to to remain strong and built up, Lord, as we carry out, Lord, this journey that you have us on in this world. And so, Lord, I pray that we not only have ears to hear, but hearts to receive. That by faith, we'll receive this into our hearts. And, Lord, that your Holy Spirit abiding in us will empower us to, to apply it, appropriate it to our lives, to walk it out, ultimately to bring you glory. Lord, to, to shed light in darkness and to bring hope and, and victory to, to those that are lost in despair without you. And also to bless us as your people. So God, be with the teachers and the helpers and the kids downstairs. Grow them up. Build up their faith as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me just establish a foundation and I'll, I'll, I'll just hit some of the main points. This this is considered by many one of Paul's greatest epistles. Epistle is, is it's known as a distinctive letter that's written to a group or a, an individual. They're typically longer, a little more formal, but they carry value and are worthy of honor. They're, they're purposeful. And they're kind of, uh, they, they're, they're instructional, kind of like a, a teacher-student type of 
uh, type of writing. And, and generally, all New Testament epistles or letters are for the people's edification. It's to build us up in this faith. And Apostle Paul, he claims it, first, first uh, verse, claims it, authorship. He spent, as I mentioned, he was briefly there at the, towards the end of his second missionary journey, started a church, and then he came back and spent almost three years there. Uh, it was agreed that he, what's widely agreed is that Paul wrote this book. It's one of the prison epistles, one of the prison letters that Paul wrote in prison along with Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. But what's maybe not as agreed upon is which prison he was in. In writing it between, towards the end of his uh, missionary journeys, be probably between 60 and 63 A.D., the recipients, who is this letter to? Now, this, this foundation and this context, is, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help us with a, a greater and, and deeper understanding so that, so that we can apply it to our lives in 2024. It's, although it's titled Ephesians, there's, there's much evidence, and we won't get into all this evidence, that it's, it's more of a circular letter that went out. Not, not necessarily to a specific church, although it could have certainly went to a church in Ephesus, but... When I'm talking to some uh, people at some uh, uh, national events or regional events, they'll say, where, where are you from? And if I say Burnsville, they're just kind of, uh, 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 where? Uh, so uh, I might say, I'm from the Minneapolis area. And, uh, and then I'll get specific. Burnsville, we're a suburb of, of Minneapolis. So mo most people know where Minneapolis is. Not, not a whole lot of people nationally know where Burnsville is. And so when we're talking about Ephesus, we could be talking about the, the surrounding area and region of, of Ephesus, was, which was in the Roman Empire of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, if, you, if, if you're interested. But it was written to what he clarified as saints who were there and faithful to Christ. And uh, the reason why it's circular, in other letters, he drops names. He drops names, but he doesn't drop any personal names here. And that's why it's believed that it went to many, many churches churches but Ephesus was a capital city of the Roman Empire it was the center of commercial uh, uh, trade during that time and so Paul uh, very wisely decided that that's going to be the center of his missionary work at that time and probably spent more time here than any place else in his ministry when we talk about a main theme of of Ephesians this is different than some of the other letters to specific churches. He's not addressing any specific issues. He's not necessarily bringing correction to a local church. It's a very positive letter. It's, it's, it's very upbeat. It's informing Christians about how much God is for us. I think we need to be reminded of that sometimes. Sometimes we can be our worst critic. You know, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You have to realize this. God is for you. Even with your stumbles and mistakes, God is still for you. And so this letter will really bring this out. And so as comparative to, say, some uh, the letter like Romans, that is, uh, speaks and it, it addresses a lot of, uh, regards a lot of individual things, Ephesians speaks or addresses the community of individuals together as a church, as a church like Stonebridge. So Paul presents this very high view of the church and he emphasizes how it's made up of believers of truth and here here's so important they're united together in christ they're one body in christ so ephesians as we look at it has basically two halves six chapters the first three central doctrines of the faith of christianity and the last three will deal with our conduct and behavior as a church collectively and so, uh, uh, um, like most of Paul's letters, it's going to off, offer knowledge and information and then application. Uh, applicable in first century Roman Empire, applicable in America, United States of America, Burnsville specifically, in 2024. And so like Ephesian, the Ephesian churches, because I believe it went to more than just one, uh, just like, like these ancient body of believers, they, they shared a lot of the same challenges that you and I face today. Because there's another part of this book that says there's nothing new under the sun. And human beings have been human beings since the Garden of Eden. If, so this community and, and, and uh, a world around them, they, they worshipped idols, mythical gods and goddesses, uh, uh, empirical, uh, the empirical cult that was going on. Do you know dozens of, 
and dozens of temples dedicated to the emperors who were referred to as, as gods. And uh, as well as, you know, simply just the temptations of the flesh as, as one resource cited it. And for us, we think about us, we, of course, deal with the temptations of, of the flesh. That's not going to disappear until we receive our glorified bodies. Idols, they say, well, I don't, I don't, there's idols all over the place, especially in America, from what I can see. And, um, and then there's this information. Uh, can, I, can I opine too much information that is so accessible? And everybody being able to claim, hey, I'm an expert on anything, including being an expert on God and your life and the direction of your life. And so challenges, same then as there is now. And so we, we see this as we just press in through these first few verses here. And that Paul was an apostle. Apostle simply means one who is sent out. And Paul certainly was. He was personally sent out or commissioned by Jesus Christ himself with an authority to proclaim the gospel. And it was by God's will, not Paul's. We won't go into it, but those of you uh, that are familiar with the word of God, you know that Paul was a persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. And it was when he was on his way to Damascus that Jesus pretty much said, you know what, that's enough, Paul. And uh, knocked him down, blinded him for a, a, a while, and uh, revealed himself. But he, he uh, in that process, raised him up to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest apostle of all time. So he claims authorship of this letter, and, and he defines to whom it's addressed, and it's the saints. Just like then, just like now. The saints in Ephesus. Ephesus. Saint, saint just means, it's, it's a, saint is reference to a holy one, or those who are set apart. And so by virtue of what Christ has done on the cross, and through our repentance and faith and putting our trust in him, all who put their faith and trust in Christ are considered a saint. So husbands, next time your wives uh, try to call you something else, remind them, pastor said that I am a saint. Amen. I haven't used that in a while, and I'll just keep it in my back pocket. I'm not going to say, I don't know if I'll use it or not, but... Uh, but, I'm, but, but what, what we need to realize here, if we're going to live this overcoming victorious life that, that, that Christ has offered to us, we, we must do it as saints of God. We have to do it as saints. And not just any kind of saints, but faithful saints as it is brought out. It's faithful, speaking of a, of a spiritual position. When we are meeting him face to face on that one final day, just you and God, what is he going to say? Is he going to say good and productive Servant, good and loving servant, good and holy servant. He's going to say, good and faithful servant. God's very interested in our faithfulness. It's a big deal to him. And so we know that this letter was addressed to the faithful saints of God. And, and together, I think they recognize that God is the Father. So Paul includes in his usual salutation in, in all of his letters, all 13 of them, 14, if you think he wrote Hebrews, that's again, not all agreed upon. But he had this same salutation of using grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. And it was always in that order because it has to be in that order. The horse comes before the cart, right? Not cart before horse, but grace comes before peace. We heard last week how that word peace was the first word spoken out of Jesus' mouth after his resurrection when he appeared before his disciples that peace he knew that they had already experienced God's grace and now that they were ready to receive his peace you will never know true peace if you first don't have God's grace I'm going to say that again you will never know true peace unless you first experience God's grace because peace as I said was a, it's a state of being it's not something that comes and goes it's it's a result of living in the grace of God the unmerited favor of God, which is so key in this passage of these six verses that we are looking at. So first I want to emphasize that we are talking about one God, and it, in this course of uh, uh, passages, really verses, verse 3 through 14 in the original manuscript, one sentence. 
And in that sentence, it really brings out God in three persons. It really talks about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in this first six verses, he's emphasizing God as both Father and Son. In verse 2, he said, God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's signifying the Father belonging to, to us. And, and in verse 3, he says, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, referring that we belong to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And so it's through the Son of God that we are reconciled and connected and related to God as so we can call him Father. He is our spiritual and heavenly Father. So John, John records Jesus speaking about this several times. John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and my Father are one. Same essence, same nature. Even while, yes, even while he walked this earth fully. God and fully man. Had to be. Couldn't be just fully God or they never would have been able to kill him. Couldn't have, couldn't have just been fully man or he never would have been able to, to defeat sin and death. Fully God, fully man. John 14 and verse 20 and 21. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. And he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Much said about Father and Son. Lastly, John 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And Paul, Paul's, a, Paul's a name dropper. He, he, he drops personal names in some of his other uh, letters, but he especially drops God's name, which is never a bad thing. But there's he, probably be a reason, especially in this book, because I think it's to bring clarity to all of those Gentiles that came out of paganism and became followers of Jesus Christ. Prior to their conversion, they, they, were, uh, they had heard and known and worshiping many different types of gods and goddesses. So it was important that they understand who this God, capital G, true and only God, really, were, really was. Because he was the only one that would ultimately be able to bring them redemption and, and salvation. And so he, he goes on to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this blessed here is not the same as the next blessed. As that verse says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This, this blessed, is, it's only used for God in the New Testament. And it's simply meaning to speak well of. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to speak well of, to give praise where it's due, praise for all that he has done. And it's, it's, it, he's worthy of being blessed because of who he is, what he's done, and, and because he has already, and this is past tense, we'll bring this out, has already at this point blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ or in Christ's finished work. And so he's now talking about spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. This bless, this next bless that he, he blesses us with, is, it means to cause to prosper, to make happy, to benefit us with every kind of blessing. I know, I know, many, I know many people love to leverage the Bible to talk about prosperity and material blessings. I'm not against that. I'm not, I'm not against it, but, I'm, but I am against taking the word of God out of context. I am talking about ravenous wolves that are coming into the church. I, I am against those that are among you saying perverse things, leading you astray, down a path away from the main thing that should be the main thing. 
And uh, so this is something to, to, to really remember. Most of the blessings that the Bible speaks about are spiritual. The spiritual. Because these prosperity preachers are going to have to explain some things to, to, to the passages that said the poor, they're going to always be among you. The poor will always be among us. Where is their, they don't have enough faith to believe for a truckload of cash to back into their driveway and dump it in, dump it in their property? Come on. But when you're talking about spirit blessings, they are, they are far better than any material or temporal or fleeting blessings that we could possibly have. These blessings are higher than all of those. Just, just like God's thoughts, so much higher than our thoughts. These, these blessings, they're secure. They, they won't, they won't, they're not able to be stolen. They're not able to be rust and, and, and fade away. And these blessings are lasting far beyond just this life, but even into eternity. It's important to know here that this us that, 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 that they're talking about in this verse 3, it's not just Gentiles, but you know there was Jews that now came to recognize Jesus Christ as the true Messiah and as Lord. And Savior. So this us is, this will come out some more as we get into this letter. That we're talking about both Jews and Gentiles. Now, now spiritually undistinguished, but one as, as, as children of God. Having to come to the Father the same way, the Jews having to come to the Father the same way as the Gentiles. No one cometh unto the Father except through me, said Jesus our Lord. And so we see that he has blessed us. And these, the, there's a further description here of these spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. Spirit belonging to him, the divine spirit. That's what it's referencing. Coming from the Holy Spirit, uh, exhibiting its effects the, and, and his effects and his character. And they're concrete, as, as one lexicon puts it, concrete and Anytime I see concrete, I stop, if, if for nothing else, just because of thanking God he got me out of it. But, uh, <laughs> but meaning, meaning this spiritual blessing that has been spoken of in verse 3 here, it's, it's literal. It, it's, it's real. It's tangible. And it's to benefit us. So, so he talks about, as I mentioned, that he has blessed us. Not will, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This means that we don't have to ask for something that we already have. I think this is in reference to what Pastor Zach was saying as the Holy Spirit was leading this morning. Of there are things available to us from the Lord that we're simply not taking access to. I've heard there's some wonderful things that I could find at Aldi's, but I've never been in the store in my life. And so I can think about how great it would be when I hear people say, you got to get this from Aldi's. And I, you know, as long as I never walk into Aldi's, I will never get what they're talking about. But there are things, spiritual blessings in heavenly places because of what Christ did and our relationship with him that are available to us that we, we simply don't, don't, don't receive. We don't take on in our lives. We don't apply them in our lives by, by faith. And Paul uses, Paul uses heavenly places intentionally. As I mentioned, it's important and it's where, where Christ is. We're going to hear that a lot in, in, this, in this letter. In heavenly places, heavenly, not in the earthly realm. Again, talking about most blessings are spiritual. Not in the earthly realm. They're, not etern they're, they're, they're eternal and not temporal. And these spiritual blessings are because of what Christ did on that cross. It's the only way that they're made available. It's, it's the only way that the Holy Spirit was able to come and, and abide in us and to empower us to live a life as a saint, worthy of being his sons and his daughters. We have the Lord here, as I mentioned, evident in these first six verses as father and son, as he appropriates he made this selection as he sent his only son to go to that cross and to die for you and I that's why he came up with this chosen purpose that we see in verse 4 verse 4 said just as he chose us 
in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. Hmm, before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Where else, where else have we heard before the foundation of the world? Well, John 17 and 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, this is Jesus speaking, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. If you were here during our Journey to the Cross series, we can see that that Christ's journey to the cross began before the foundations of this world. 1 Peter 1 and 20 says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. So just as he chose us in him. Now, beginning to step into some disagreement in the theological arena. Some see this as a person being chosen rather than the purpose for which the person is chosen. So the purpose is chosen, not the individual person as to whether they're going to be lost or saved. And the purpose for which the person is chosen is that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I'm going to repeat that. This is important. Just as he chose us in him, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Some see this as a person being chosen, but I am here to say that it's the purpose for which the person was chosen that was before the foundation of this world. And the purpose that was before the foundation of the world for which that person is chosen is that they should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know what that is? That's a saint describing a saint of God. And this is always something that's been desirous of the Lord. And for the sake of time, I'm going to just continue to get to uh, this next point of, of uh, predestined to adoption. As verse 5 goes on to say, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And as I said, now here we are, we're, we're attempting to reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility. And again, so some, some hear this predestined to adoption as sons of God. I mean, he chose and predestined whether I was going to have the possibility of being saved and spend eternity in heaven. Again, some see this as the person being, pre, pre, being predestined rather than the means by which they become a member of God's family. And he's talking about adoption. The predestination was the adoption so that we had the ability to become the sons and daughters of God. Predestined, it's, uh, it means to foreordain, to appoint beforehand, to obtain the means by which we could be adopted as sons and daughters by our Heavenly Father. And you realize that as adopted sons and daughters, they, uh, even, even in today's legalities, they have the same rights, the same privileges, and the same benefits as a child born into that family. That is why Christ did it for us. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus Christ did it all on that cross and, and rose from the dead. And, and he deposits his finished work into our life account just as if we did it. It's amazing. We're talking about the privileges of knowing God the Father through his Son. This should, this should grip us to our, to our souls if we're, in, if we're in touch or in tune at all with our spiritual being, with how we're doing in our mind and in our thoughts and in how our, how our lives are going. And so what I liked about it, I, I was reading up on one, one scholar proposed using the term pre-planned instead of predestined, and I kind of I liked that thought. 
pre-planned instead of predestined. So just to better understand what he did is this. God has always had a plan for us to be saved, but he had to carry it out. And so it's our responsibility to respond, not reject, and believe, not doubt, the plan that he chose and predestined for you and I to know him as Lord and Savior. Before the foundation's world, pre-planned adoption is what I called it. Because the Son of God sacrificed on the cross. Is that your opinion, Pastor Kurt? No. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5.15, the Apostle Paul says, And he died for only the chosen and predestined. No, no, wrong, 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 wrong translation. That's perverse. He died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. In Ephesians 1 and 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God was overjoyed to impart every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ to his children. And this is what God's grace is about. As the worship team comes, this is, this is, this, these first six verses are marinating in God's grace. None of us, let me speak for myself, I would not be here if it were not for God's grace. My, my, my. giving me something that I absolutely did not deserve. Again, it's only by his grace that we're even able to respond and to accept his finished work that he did on that cross. And it's only he and his favor towards us that is even worthy of glory as, as the word of God brings out here. There, there, is, there is nothing in and of myself all of my doings and accomplishments and accolades and whatever giftings and talents and abilities I do have, none, none of it. I have no merit to stand before a holy and righteous and just God and say, I'm worthy. Embrace me. Bless me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Oh yeah, there is that last part. In Christ. In Christ, in his finished work on that cross. Let's stand today. How many are grateful for God's grace in your life? God's amazing, amazing, amazing grace. God's amazing grace. We're going to be seeing this down the line, but one of the most profound and highlighted passages in this letter written by Paul is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. As Paul says, if I'm going to boast... I'm going to boast in my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to let's have the worship team just lead us in a chorus as we respond to the word of God as, as it has been received into your hearts, believing that by faith God is stirring it and bringing order to it. And again, if, I know I said a lot in a short amount of time. If you could go maybe listen again or read through and study on your own those first six verses of Ephesians. But let's, let's, just, let's just give this to the Lord right now as the worship team leads us.